Hi everyone and welcome back to Vague Ramblings uh, with a Star Wars video that I sort of debated whether I was going to do this one or not, but I kind of got to my breaking point and was just like, you know what, I, I gotta say something. So for those of you who don't know, I'm a massive Star Wars fan. I know it may seem like I'm just the horror movie guy, but I'm also a massive Star Wars fan because Star Wars, when I saw the original film uh, when I was like three, four years old, was the film that changed my life. It's the one that inspired a very little me to become interested in movies, uh, moving images, visual storytelling, and really what sort of started my path down wanting to make movies and fall in love with movies and everything. So Star Wars has been, is, and will always be my favorite film. And, you know, following along the stories throughout the years between the original trilogy, the prequels, and everything, and even some of the offshoots on uh, television and whatnot, you know, it's just been sort of a really rewarding and rich thing to be a fan of, to be a part of on that level. And it's just, it's, been fantastic you know it's a constant inspiration um for me and it's just fun you know it's just fun to be in that star wars world now when star wars was sold to disney and it became this whole other thing it um i was skeptical but at the same time i was also sort of like well maybe it'll work because it is a property that uh could be handled correctly if done right you know i mean there's some people kind of have this back and forth as to whether or not you know is it a good idea to have fans work in a property and sort of further it um for the most part i would say yes but that doesn't mean you can't be a little careful with how you handle it so when you have fans who can come in and continue a story and do it properly like in the case of creed within the case in my opinion uh blade runner 2049 and a couple other things then in, in it works great now in the case of star wars you know we do have elements where especially in the television world where there's expansion on the existing universe, which works very well. The movies have been kind of iffy, in my opinion. Now, when I first saw Force Awakens, I must admit I was, no pun intended, but I was sort of forcing myself to like the film a lot more than I did. Because I've always been such a defender of Star Wars that it almost that sort of knee-jerk reaction almost kind of kicks in. The funny thing is then it ended up I was defending Star Wars against myself. Now, you know, some of those may feel that way about the prequels. I personally love the prequels. I mean, even for some of their faults, the, the, the faults that bother some people just don't bother me. You know, so it's the kind of thing where I love those films. And again, you know, I'm, I've had to defend them on many occasion. So, but it was the kind of thing where the defense of those was very easy for me because I was a, a huge fan. I love what was kind of being done as a whole. So it was easy to do. Now with the newer films, I sort of found myself kind of debating like, man, do I really like this? Just because I'm seeing some of these characters that I love, you know, as far as Han Solo and Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker. And it's just like, yeah, but something just seems off and it just it's not working for me. But I denied it literally for the longest time. Uh, then Rogue One came out and Rogue One. Um, I actually do really like my main problem with Rogue One is I kind of just don't care about any of the characters um, kind of thing. But I love the story. I love the, that one to me felt more like it kind of fit a little bit more into the universe. Still feels like a fan film but I'm okay it's a kind of one where it's just like this is I, I kind of like this and I didn't feel like it messed up anything in the universe in any way whereas I don't feel the same way about The Force Awakens and I definitely don't feel that way about The Last Jedi so I'm going to tackle uh, Force Awakens another time um, kind of thing and even Last Jedi, and Last Jedi, I'm actually not even going to touch. I mean, honestly, if you want to see a masterful dissection of that, go watch the five-hour breakdown 
that Mahler did on that film. And that thing is, what he did was genius. Now, some of you may notice I am wearing a Phantom Menace t-shirt, uh, which may mean that some of you are sort of on board with it. Some of you may roll your eyes, but you know what? I kind of really like what a lot of those guys over there are doing with, um, as far as like Ethan Van Skyver and Geese and Gamers and world-class bullshitters and some of those channels. Uh, I just think that they're really trying to keep Star Wars from sort of going off this weird track that it's on. It's like a, a train that's on this high speed collision course you know it's like the track ends and it's just gonna go right off the rail and the people in front are just be like nope faster 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 and it's like no let's let's slow down a bit now one of the things that actually has put me over to realize that like you know what i need to jump in to this because i do love star wars and i need to say something about it is the fact that i really don't like how the people in charge are going after the fandom over criticism Now, none of the Star Wars films really face as much criticism as the prequels did um, among the fandom. And George Lucas, while I know he was very much dismayed um, and even possibly disappointed in it, you know, he never came out and he never accused the fandom of being racist, sexist, or any of the other terms that are so popular now that get overused and unfortunately lose all meaning. And specifically with the director of The Last Jedi, you know, calling all the people complaining man babies and so on and so forth. Well, I've kind of just about had it with that. I mean, thing is, I don't mind an artist defending their work. Believe me, I've been there. The question is, you can defend it and then you can just walk away. You know, you don't double down on insulting people who basically have an invested interest in a property. That's the thing that I think is getting lost. If... You know, if some of these filmmakers did their own film and they was being attacked and it was just like, look, this is what I was trying to do with the film. But when you're working in a pre-existing property like Star Wars, a lot of people are invested in that world. You can't just come in and just be like, well, I'm going to do my own thing and like, screw you guys. And if you don't like it, well, then, you know, again, you're just a bunch of man babies. It's like, okay, no. So I'm kind of sick and tired of that. So I am going to reference something that was actually done on Twitter. Now, I'm kind of getting sick in Twitter because basically Twitter has gotten to the point where I've actually found that, you know, some people that I really like, I really don't like if I follow them on Twitter. So I'm whittling down my Twitter account. I figured it was like, I'd rather live in ignorance of people than find out what they uh, think about everything going on in the world. But a tweet was done by someone on Twitter referencing an old article that was, I think, part of an interview with uh, George Lucas and Lawrence Kasdan. Now, the article, I believe, goes back to uh, maybe between um, Empire and Jedi or after Jedi or something along those lines. Um, So Kasdan is like, I think you should kill Luke and have Leia take over. George Lucas, you don't want to kill Luke. Kazan, okay, then kill Yoda. Lucas, I don't want to kill Yoda. You you don't have to kill people. You're, You're a product of the 80s. You don't go around killing people. It's not nice. I think you alienate the audience. Kazan, I'm saying that the movie has more emotional weight. If someone you love is lost along the way, the journey has more impact. George Lucas, I don't like that, and I don't believe that. I've always hated that in movies when you go along and one of the main characters gets killed. This is a fairy tale. You want everybody to live happily ever after, and nothing bad happens to anybody. The whole emotion I'm trying to get at the end of the film is for you to be real uplifted emotionally and spiritually and feel absolutely good about life. Now, George Lucas may have altered that viewpoint over the years a little bit, but the fact of the matter is the point, and and again, this person sort of circled those points, is that there is something along those lines. Now, the director of The Last Jedi responded, and he responded in a weird way, which sort of, one, it's another kind of weird attack on a fan. I mean, he basically could just have ignored this. And especially since I'm not ripping on the person who posted this, but it's someone who basically doesn't really have a lot of followers. Not that I have that many, but, you know, I'm just kind of pointing that out. It's like, so why are you going after someone? And especially you're bringing up points that, quite honestly, are not really in your favor. So the director responded, huh, using a couple pictures from some of the films. And I think he's trying to make a point, but unfortunately, he's not really understanding them. 
So the first one is obviously of from the original Star Wars, from A New Hope, of Uncle Ben and Beru um, after they were killed by the stormtroopers, and you see their, you know, corpses smoking from being burned alive. And again, this is where the point is kind of getting lost. Star Wars is, at least as it was originally set up, was supposed to be the Skywalker story. So them dying gives Luke sort of the last reason that he has to stay on Tatooine. Again, it's Luke's journey in the original trilogy. So and the fact is, Lucas in that original article was trying to illustrate sort of your main characters, you know, the heroes on the journey. You know, and the question is, everyone around the main characters, specifically the main character, is there to almost serve a purpose on their journey. George Lucas used mythology that has been around forever to tell these stories in the Star Wars films. And this, you know, this is all part of the hero's journey. So right away, that first thing, you know, it's it's meant to have Luke make a decision. Is he gonna still stay on Tatooine, even though now he has no connection to it now that his remaining family has been murdered? Or is he gonna go along with Obi-Wan on the journey to Alderaan. So already he's he's already wrong on the first point. Next, he has the death of Obi-Wan Kenobi by Darth Vader. Once again, Obi-Wan's death is a self-sacrifice. You know, if you remember from the film, Obi-Wan holds up his lightsaber so that he can allow Darth Vader to strike him down. Knowing that he will become a force ghost and from there still help guide Luke on his journey. So once again, the point is lost. And then again, he has one from Empire where Luke loses his hand. Part of the point of Luke losing his hand is the fact that he gets a robot hand, which comes back in Return of the Jedi when as he's fighting Darth Vader and he's about to win the fight, and he cuts off Vader's robotic hand and he looks down and he sees the mechanics in the arm and he looks up at his own robotic hand. He realizes that he's already on a similar journey to become just like Darth Vader. And that's finally when he realizes that he cannot strike in anger and he actually becomes a Jedi. And then we have Yoda's death in Return of the Jedi, but that's a character that when it decided that Yoda died, first off, Yoda isn't killed. He dies because his time has come. He's old and he realizes that there's nothing more he can do. So it's time for him to crossover into the force basically and it also helps Luke's character realizes that in some ways he is now alone and he has to make his own choices which is when he decides that he needs to go and confront Darth Vader now he didn't let it go he decided to double down with some more so he uses uh Anakin after his fight with Obi-Wan in Revenge of the Sith when Anakin basically supposedly when he's full gone in essence Darth Vader at that point screaming I hate you at Obi-Wan he's completely on the dark side there is no hope for him and at some point you think he's probably dead I mean obviously as an audience we know he isn't but you know that's why Obi-Wan basically leaves him there scarred and burned and everything before he's found by Palpatine. And in the prequels, of course, is Anakin Skywalker's story. So that is, again, part of his journey because he needs to fall in order to become Darth Vader. And then there's a picture of Padme during the birth sequence where she dies after giving birth. Um, I'm not sure why that was included because the thing is, the prequels are meant to go into the storyline that the original trilogy went into. She dies so that the twins are then separated uh, for the safety. Obviously, Leia goes to Alderaan and Luke goes to Tatooine. So Padme's story ends there because then we transition into Luke's story. And then he shows Qui-Gon's death which again, Qui-Gon's death has a bigger meaning. His death is what pushes Obi-Wan Kenobi to become a master and 
train Anakin. It forces the council to also accept the fact that Anakin is going to be trained, even though a lot of them sort of kind of feel it may not be the right thing to do. And even though it's a kind of thrown away, which I kind of wish it wasn't, but the fact of the matter is Qui-Gon is actually the one who also starts to discover that he can commune through the Force to people, which um, I wish there was a little bit more done with that in the prequels, but that's um, it's, it's a little bit of a throwaway line towards the end of Revenge of the Sith, but um, still, but the death is meaning, and it is part of Anakin's journey in the prequels. And then he has a picture of Mace Windu's fight with Palpatine, which is a really weird one to add as well, because that was part of dismantling the Jedi Council and it also has to do with the fact that that's also the moment when Anakin decides that he's not a Jedi but he will actually go along with Palpatine and join the dark side that's also the moment when he technically becomes Darth Vader I mean I think he fully becomes Darth Vader by the end of the movie but that's sort of that first step because he comes in, he sees the struggle between Palpatine and Windu, and Anakin makes the choice to interfere, which obviously ends up in the death of Mace Windu. And of course, that's the, the fall of the Republic and the rise of the Empire and all of that. And then one last thing, which he puts as bonus track, is the death of the younglings by Anakin at the Jedi Council. Now, that's also a weird one to add because, again, that's part of Anakin's journey. And I think it was one of those where you have to see how dedicated Anakin has become to the dark side. And it also shows how much he actually does love Padme because he's willing to do things that he probably normally would not have by going in and not only killing as many Jedis as he can, but also the one, the young ones that are in training. I mean, I still remember when that scene was shown in the theater. You know, there were gasps when that lightsaber sort of lit up. So what's the point of this? Well, the point I think that he was trying to make was just like, you know, Lucas was saying like how it's everything's supposed to be happy and uplifted and everything. Now, what Lucas is referencing, though, is the end of the journey. Not the beginning, not the middle, but the end. Where you end up on your journey in order to inspire people, usually you, it needs to be a happy ending. Now, pointing out these other things that he did, the death of some side characters or anything, and, and things that are helping to move along our hero's journey, whether or not it's in the original trilogy, whether or not it's in the prequel trilogy, the fact of the matter is, the point he's making is completely wrong. And I think this is actually kind of a big realization as to why I think The Last Jedi was kind of a disaster. He tries to make a point by pointing to all these things that on the surface he thinks he's making a point, but the meaning of everything that he showed does not actually fall into the point that he's trying to make, which really explains a lot because he doesn't really understand Star Wars. It takes more to being a fan of Star Wars than just having some of the cool collectibles, like my little R2 over here. There's a deeper meaning that goes just beyond starships and lightsabers and robots and the Force and all that stuff. And it goes back to the classical hero's journey and mythology and all of that and I really think part of the problem with these new films is that they're not going off what the original meaning to these films was inspired by the fans who are basically in charge of the newer films J.J. Abrams and R.J. and J.J. Abrams again is the fact that I really think that there's a lack of true understanding as to why the original films actually work as well as they do and that's because George Lucas had a firm grasp on that classical storytelling that you can't just make new films literally just based on the original films you almost have to go back to their original sources 
in uh, literature and everything and even some of the movies that inspired George in from a visual standpoint. But now that doesn't mean you can't make the films your own on some level. But the thing is, if you're doing more of an offshoot film, um, it doesn't matter. I think you can be allowed to do whatever you want as long as it really doesn't interrupt sort of the main canon because uh, between episodes seven and eight, they are unfortunately canon. They really just are kind of messed up because I think their main problem was that all they did was just base everything off the original films and not expand it beyond the original inspirations were for those films and the whole point i mean the thing is in these new films i mean where's the hero's journey who does it belong to is it ray not really you know she's again i mean i hate to use the term but in many ways she is a mary sue she's almost perfect at everything and people point out like well but she gets hurt yeah um, getting hurt is not the same thing as growing i don't think she's actually grown in any of the films uh, which is a shame because I think in, originally um, a lot of these characters were, I think, um, could have been done really well. Part of my upset with these new films also is the fact that we have had a really big missed opportunity. I'm not saying this is the way things should have gone. This is just what I think I would have liked to have seen. Let's say that they would have actually gone ahead and even introduced the same characters that you have now. You know, Ray, Finn, Poe, for example, as your sort of core three characters. And then you have uh, Kylo Ren as sort of your main villain with Snoke kind of out there, sort of emperor type role. But episode seven should have still been about Luke, Han, and Leia. And it wasn't. The problem is what you what you what you needed was a transition between the Han Luke Leia story and the the Ray Finn Poe Kylo story. But because they didn't do that and they just jumped into the new characters, it's the kind of thing where okay, you just lost your opportunity. And especially now because obviously they killed off Han Solo. And unfortunately, Carrie Fisher is no longer with us. And of course, they now killed off Luke Skywalker as well. So it's like, okay, so none of that will ever happen ever. So I know for some of us, like, you know, it's easy to kind of feel pretty cheated, especially since nothing new has been introduced. I mean, the new films really just kind of feel like copies of the older films. Again, without almost like a true understanding of of I, I think what made the original film so special because the thing is if you had episode seven be about Han, Luke, Leia and everything is kind of fine for the most part you know the Republic is 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 doing great and Han and Leia have their son Ben who's being trained by Luke Skywalker but Luke notices that there's something strange going on with Kylo Ren and Kylo is sort of going through a very similar, almost Anakin kind of thing, where he feels that he's so much powerful than everyone, but, you know, Luke Skywalker is holding him back. So he begins he begins to resent Luke on some ways. Snoke sort of sees this and is able to sort of start teasing Kylo that, you know, you can be more powerful. Now, some of that can be very, like, it may not be introduced yet, but the whole Snoke thing, but... Then you have aspects of the, like the First Order, for example. Everyone thinks the First Order is just a small faction. They're almost like this, just a terrorist faction that even though they do do damage on some level, they're not this big, all-powerful thing. There's an overall a threat to the Republic. It's just something that unfortunately just has to be dealt with every so often. You can have then like a Finn character who escapes the First Order joins up with the Republic and tries to warn them, like, you don't understand. The First Order has actually have all this power and they are going to unleash it and everyone just ignores them. And it's just like, no, if that was the case, we would know about it. And same thing with Luke. Luke is kind of like, you know, if there was a rise of the dark side, he would sense it. You know, he knows the struggle that's going on in Kylo, but his focus is so much on that that 
He doesn't sense Snoke from afar and the rise of the First Order either. So then you have this sort of big buildup where maybe there's more and more attacks and everything and Kylo starts to become much more aggressive, which can lead up to the end of Episode 7 where you can still have Han Solo die because I know Harrison Ford doesn't really want to play Han Solo anymore. So you can still have Han Solo die at the hands of his son, which is that sort of final turn to the dark side when it's just when you know we realize that uh, Ben is now Kylo Ren and he goes to join Snoke and and you can have him even defeat Luke Skywalker in a fight not kill him but defeat him and so which causes Luke then to be sort of like you know what is going on and doesn't know how to do and then you have the First Order do a massive attack that wipes out a good portion of the Republic and everyone including Leia is just caught off guard, you know, not realizing that Finn was right this whole time and saying that First Order is indeed a threat and they have now just taken over. In which case, then the Republic now goes back to being the rebellion. And that's how you end Episode 7. And then you, Episode 8, then you start kind of building up the newer characters and everything. And then, you know, from there you can do what you want with uh, Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia and everything. And it's just the kind of thing where you needed that transition and you needed the times that we all wanted with Han, Luke, and Leia and everything. Even if you do end up killing them all off, it's the kind of thing where, but we needed that before you transition into newer characters. But we're not going to get that. I mean, I'm not saying my idea isn't necessarily any better, but I just think as a fan my whole life that's at least the kind of thing where i kind of feel like that's something where that would have fed what older fans wanted so where does this leave us as fans well it depends on where you fall if you're a casual fan i mean the the a lot of the people i know who do enjoy the newer films um some of them are hardcore fans and they are ones who basically they're just like you know what i'm just happy that star wars films are just still getting made and honestly there's nothing wrong with that in fact I kind of wish I was one of them and then you have people who like the new films but they don't have the same commitment they're basically they just want popcorn entertainment they're not the ones who go out and they they don't buy all the collectibles and see the movies you know 10 times and buy every release on video that ever comes out and everything you know they're the ones that'll see the film you know opening weekend or within the first week or two and that's probably it maybe they'll buy the blu-ray or something maybe but the hardcore fans that is uh, that are so invested in it that have been pretty upset with the way the new films are going you know, to just ignore them, to call them racists and bigots and man babies and who knows what else, you know, it's like everything under the sun. Now, I'm not saying you make every decision possible by listening to the fan base, but you have to understand when things are upset. And the fact that Solo was the first box office bomb, which is weird to say because the film is gross, like, you know, $350 million. And to think that a film is a bomb that grossed that much, the fact of the matter is it it... it it is a bomb and it's gross $350 million worldwide on a budget that is currently unknown because as most of you know, the film, the original directors were fired and then they sort of scrambled. They managed to get Ron Howard to come on and Ron Howard, to my knowledge, reshot about 70% of the film. So what that means is that the original directors, it's not like they shot for like two weeks and then all of a sudden it was just like, this isn't working out. We need to kind of start over, which means they shot most of the film and then they turned around and got someone else and reshot most of the film again. And Star Wars films are not cheap to make. For example, Rogue One, um, cost $200 million, which means Solo originally probably had a semi similar budget could even been a little bit more because solo you know the character of han solo is so much more known than what was happening with rogue one rogue one was actually more of a gamble because it doesn't really you know your your biggest draw was the fact that they teased that darth vader would show up in it briefly and it had to do with the death star but beyond that i mean it was there wasn't really anything that 
was marketable outside of the fact that it was a Star Wars movie. Han Solo, you had, you know, you had two things there. You had Star Wars and you had a very recognized character. So my guess is that Solo was a very expensive film even before they went and reshot almost the whole thing. My estimate, and I don't know this for a fact, I'm just making a guess, but at the end of the day, after you factor in the fact that the film was practically shot twice, and again, all the post-production work and everything, my guess is that the budget is probably somewhere around $350 million, literally where it's at worldwide at the box office. Now, for a film to be a success, especially on that level, you usually have to estimate that it has to gross approximately three times its budget before it becomes profitable. That's just an easy way to kind of guess. That way, after you include marketing and all the other kind of costs involved. So for a film like Solo, for example, it literally needs to gross about a billion dollars worldwide before it really becomes profitable. That's not going to happen, which means Solo is a massive loss. Now you can say, well, Disney doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter Disney, it doesn't need it. Um, yes, on one level, but at the same end, can't have something like Star Wars not be profitable. Not in this day and age, not after 41 years of it being profitable, you know, even at its worst, you know, the Star Wars holiday special, which I actually think is better than The Last Jedi. It's still profitable. And the fact that the toys aren't really selling and the fact that the now the movies aren't really doing well. And it's not Solo's fault um, kind of thing because it inherited some of the fault of what happened with uh, really the first two films but obviously the last jedi more so that people were just a lot more cautious going forward what does that mean for future star wars movies what does it mean for future star wars merchandise and everything else that kind of goes along with it and the problem is it's kind of up in the air because you need to now prove to people that you care about the property you care about the fans, the hardcore fans, the the more casual fans, you know, they'll show up. I mean, the casual fans, I think, will basically kind of be there. But then you have to start making these films, obviously, for a lot less because the hard, a lot of the hardcore fans who have not really been that happy are going to be like, you know what, we're staying home. And you saw that happen with Solo. And now you have a film lost a lot of money. Now, some people are claiming it lost like $80 million. No, it lost more than that. And it lost more than that because of how it's going to go going forward. So, for example, the merchandising rights. So a lot of that is pre-sold. Meaning, so you go to Hasbro, for example, and be like, we want you to make all our uh, action figures and all that kind of stuff for the next X amount of films. And Hasbro is like, yes, we want Star Wars and we're going to pay this much money to get that license and produce all of our things. And so some of that is so some of the money that is lost has already been offset because of all that, including the money that Disney paid to actually buy Lucasfilm to begin with. They've gotten their money back. Now, the question is, is it a profit going forward? So when Disney then comes around after the contract is expired with Hasbro, and it's just like, hey, we want you to, you know, do more action figures for the next round of films. Hasbro would be like, okay, we'll do that. But we kind of got burned the first time around. So we're only going to pay this much uh, for those. And that's going to happen across the board. The cost for the merchandising rights is going to drop. And because the movies are going to then start making less money. And then Star Wars as a brand starts to fall, which I don't like to think about because, again, Star Wars is very special to me. Now, what does that mean for Episode 9? Um, I don't know. I think we're kind of screwed, basically, on Episode 9. Episode 9 may be a good movie, but that's, I think, about the extent of it. I think all the problems that have been set up between Episode 7 and which um, especially now that really unfortunately because it left so much up in the open basically played more like a TV pilot rather than a film. So that way when it came to The Last Jedi and The Last Jedi they basically did what you know they wanted to do and then that was that disaster. So episode 9 I mean what is really going to happen in episode 9? Is it is can episode 9 really do anything that is going to to make up for everything that has gone wrong? No. At this point you basically have to just make episode 9, get it out of there and just start over, really. You know, just 
maybe just let the old universe go and just kind of stay within the Star Wars universe, but literally kind of start from scratch. You know, don't try and take everything from the older films because obviously none of the people involved now know how to handle the elements from the old films. So just go off and do your own thing. I mean, at this point, that might be the best thing. And, you know, on occasion, we hope to get a good Star Wars film, and we might. I mean, depending on what happens going forward, maybe the right person will get in there who can run Lucasfilm, who knows how to handle it, how to handle the characters and the universe and all that stuff and make sure that it doesn't go too far off the rails. That's not to say they can't have originality in there. You definitely can. But the fact of the matter is you do have to work within the boundaries of the property and if you go too far off it then it's like well why don't you then just do your own thing you know don't have it be part of star wars so that's going to be interesting to see where we go um i hope for the best but at the end of the day i'm not as angry about it as some other people are um i can at least look back and be like you know what i love the george lucas films you know, for me, I have six films, and maybe for me, Star Wars really ended in 2005. You know, after Revenge of the Sith came out, I can be like, you know what, I have my six films, I love my six films, and that's all kind of all I need. You know, I'm, I'm happy with that, and if everything that kind of comes after that is sort of like, eh, whatever, that's fine. I'm... I can let it go if I have to, but that doesn't mean I can't at least throw in my two cents to maybe not let it go fully just yet. At least that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I, I still want Star Wars to mean something because it has meant something to me my whole life. So it's been kind of a longer video, um, but I kind of was trying to, I think, squeeze in a lot of stuff that I've been kind of feeling for a long time. So I know this ended up being a much longer video than some of the other ones, but I really wanted to get some of this stuff out uh, going forward. Whenever I do a video on Star Wars or something, it'll be a little bit more specific to something. So it shouldn't be such a long video. I just have had such a lot to say, and I basically kept my mouth shut for the longest time. And you know what? It's time I kind of jump into the, the game as well, because... I, some level, you know, again, I do have an invested interest in Star Wars. So thank you for watching, and I will see you on the next one. And as always, may the Force be with you.